everybody. How about this event, right? So thank you so much for putting this together and what a wonderful group of speakers. It's hard to come up after those two wonderful doctors. But let me try to integrate a little bit of what they were talking about into our work, which we call the ABCs, the new ABCs. Now, first, I won't be surprising anyone, or I doubt that it will be a surprise for you to hear me say that the educational system in this country is broken and it's gonna take us years to fix it. That's the bad news. But there's some good news too, and the good news is that you can transform the educational system for the children in your lives right now, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And what we're gonna talk about are what we're calling the ABCs of attention, balance, and compassion, or the new ABCs. Now it's a bit of a misnomer when we say it's the new ABCs because actually these ABCs are quite old and they were developed thousands of years ago in a number of different practices that we'll talk about a little bit later. But we call them the new ABCs because they are a great complement to the ABCs that are traditionally taught in our schools of reading, writing, and arithmetic. So let's see what we've got. So first what we're gonna talk about is what are we talking about when we say mindful awareness? And who is the person talking about mindful awareness? It's always nice to define our terms. It was great to hear Dr. Siegel talk about that this morning. And so let's start by telling you what I mean when I talk about mindfulness. Because mindfulness has gotten very popular, which is pretty fantastic. But it, with its popularity, it's beginning to mean a lot of different things. So it's important that when we talk about mindfulness, we define our terms right up front. And also, I just want to let you know that I am a mindfulness teacher, but I actually am a recovering lawyer. I started my, <laughs> I, I started my professional career as a lawyer, and I, I practiced law for a long time. Uh, I practiced transactional law. I represented, owned, and operated radio and television stations for the networks. And in the later part of my law career, I started volunteering at schools and in after-school programs, teaching mindfulness to kids as my volunteer work. One thing led to another, and now that's what I do full time. So that's who I am, and mindfulness in the way that I teach it is really mindfulness in a classical training. It, it tracks classical mindfulness training. And in classical mindfulness training, mindfulness is really thought to mean remember, to remember or to check in. So what we're going to do when we go through this program or this talk and talk about the ABCs is talk about what we're checking in on with attention, balance, and compassion when we're being mindful. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So what do we have next here? So for, for the classical training, mindfulness is a way of looking. It's a good way to think about this. Mindfulness is a way of looking at life experience. Your inner experience, your outer experience, and both together without blending the two. So how do we look at life experience? We look at it with attention, with balance, and compassion, those new ABCs I was telling you about. So what are we mindful of when we're mindful of our attention? Well, basically what we're checking in on, or what we're remembering to check in on, is where is my attention? Is my attention on the chosen object or is it someplace else? So that's what we're checking in on when we're talking about attention. What are we checking in on when we're talking about balance? We're checking in on what is the quality of my attention. Is my attention sleepy? Am I kind of sleepy? So is my attention a little drowsy and dull? Or am I alert? Am I really alert and wide awake? Or here's the third quality we look at. Is there a bias to our attention? Now remember in mindful awareness, the idea isn't that things are necessarily right or wrong. In mindful awareness, the point is the first thing we, knew, we want to do is become aware of what is going on in our mind. So just because we have a bias doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. Sometimes we're optimistic people, for example. So our bias may be an optimistic one. Not a bad bias to have, but it's important to remember that that's how your attention is. That's one of the qualities of your attention. So when we're checking in as our way of looking at the world, we're checking in on attention, balance, and compassion. And what happens when we do that is this. We tend to be in the world in a different way. So when we talk about mindfulness with adults, and remember with young children, we just say mindfulness is paying attention with kindness to yourself, other people, and the world around you. But to the adults who are talking about the mindfulness piece, just think of it as a way of looking at the world, and as we look at the world in a particular way, we tend to be in the world in a different way. So what happens next here? Oh, 
whoops, I don't know if I can go back, but we call it love with legs. That's what we call this different way of being in the world. Because it's very important when you think about mindfulness or contemplative practice that we really think of taking it off the cushion and into our real life. It's, a, it's an integrated process of looking inside and then taking what we learn from looking inside, outside. It's not one or the other, it's really a whole of inner and outer experience and both together without blending the two. So we have seven different nifty strategies that we talk about in mindfulness. And we're gonna go through those strategies now and then we're gonna relate them to the ABCs of attention, balance, and compassion. But what I would like to point out is that a lot of these strategies are strategies that we've been hearing about this morning in different disciplines as well. So it's important to remember that many, many different disciplines and ways of being and ways of seeing can come up with similar strategies and that they are not necessarily um, going against each other. What we're trying to do is bring them all together in a complementary way. And the strategies that we talk about are stopping, focusing, choosing, quieting, seeing, caring, and connecting. But if you look at this mandala, which is uh, not nearly as uh, beautiful as the one we're having made out here for us right now in our, in our um, event, in the mandala we have focusing at the center of the strategies on purpose. In mindfulness, one of the things that mindfulness does have, the tradition of mindfulness that is quite different from many of the other disciplines, is thousands of years of training in focusing. And what we're gonna talk about in a little bit is how focusing, the ability to concentrate, is really necessary not just for the A, not just for the attention piece of the ABCs, but also necessary for the B, the balance, and the C, for the compassion. Now, there's neuroscience, and we've had actual brain scientists this morning talk about the neuroscience, so I want to make sure that you remember that I am not a neuroscience. And the way I talk about science is very simple because I talk about it in a way that I can talk to children about. So we're going to talk a little bit about the neuroscience today, and we're going to talk about how the science is, is relating to these ABCs as well. How does the science relate to these strategies? And again, remember, especially when we're talking about mindfulness with children, the science is very, very young. There's a lot of science now out there with mindfulness in adults, but with the children, the science is very, very young. So it's important that we don't overstate the science, but yet we can still talk about it and think about it in the context of the adult science to help us better understand how to work with children. So the next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about stopping, which is the first strategy, and we already heard about that this morning. Stopping is also an executive skill known as inhibition, and it's really about learning to stop. And we've talked a lot today about stopping and thinking, and I, what I want to pose to you is we can also stop, feel, and then think. Stop, feel, and then think, because sometimes that thinking part of a brain isn't so reliable at a time that we need to stop. But if we can stop and feel what's happening in our body first, and then think, that's sometimes a good strategy. And we'll talk a little bit about why in a second. So A, we're at the A, the attention part of the new ABCs, right? And the two strategies that are associated with attention are really focusing and choosing. Now, we heard some about FRMI imaging this morning, and one of the scientists who was the first person to use FRMI imaging with the brain with mindfulness was Jeffrey Schwartz at UCLA. And he did a study that showed that the repeated focusing of attention over and over again on one object changes the neural pathways of the brain. So we can talk to kids about this. We can talk about making a path going to the beach or making a path through high grass and how when we walk on it over and over and over again, that path gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And remember using hand motions with kids and getting them to move like that, which Dr. Siegel did so beautifully today. This is another great way to help children better understand concepts. So we talk about making these pathways to the brain and how the br brain gets stronger the more that we focus. But it's also important to know it's not just focusing on mindfulness that strengthens the brain in that way. There's other studies out now that also show that when you focus on one thing and nothing else, a corresponding part of your brain will get bigger or grow or stronger. For instance, there's a study out of the UK with taxi drivers. And there is a part of the brain that is primarily responsible for geographic, you know, navigating, you know, busy streets in London. 
And the taxi drivers actually have a thicker part of the brain that is responsible for navigating the busy streets in London than people who aren't taxi drivers. Not mindfulness, but still the same principle, focusing on one thing and nothing else. Violinists, the same thing. There is a part of the brain that actually does take, you know, control fine finger, finger motions, the kind of fine finger motions that are necessary to practice the violin. Believe it or not, those violinists, when studied, their brains were studied, that part of their brain was a little bit bigger that controlled those fine finger movements. Same with mindfulness. Sarah Lazar out of Harvard has also done studies that shows that the part of the brain that is involved in mindfulness meditation actually gets a little bit bigger the more you meditate and is a little bit bigger than the people who don't. So we know that focused attention, focusing on one thing and nothing else, actually does make predictable changes to your brain. In adults, again, please remember this is adults. The children research is still very, very young, but we're extrapolating from the adult research. Focusing isn't enough, though. Focusing and choosing go hand in hand. We focus our attention and then we choose what we're going to focus on and we want to be choosing what we're going to focus on wisely. Remember, we're not trying to get our children to only focus on their homework and nothing else. It's just knowing where your focus is. I'm reading a book. I'm distracted by the TV in the next room. That's okay. The moment you notice you're distracted, that's a moment of mindful awareness, right? Because you know what your mind is. It's okay. And then you choose at that moment. That's your choice point. Am I going to go watch that TV or am I going to go back to reading my book? For the purposes of mindfulness, not one decision is better than the other. It's about awareness and awareness of what you're doing at that moment. I'm going to either read my book or I'm going to watch TV and it's my choice. So that's the, the strategies associated with the A. The strategies associated with B are quieting and seeing. Now, one of the things that's important to remember about mindfulness is mindfulness is really not about changing your emotions. It's not about trying to fix emotions or hide emotions or put them under the rug. It's about noticing your emotions and being able to turn in and look at them with a intention to understand, not to judge. But in order to do that, you need a couple of things. One thing you need is you need strong attention skills. Because absent strong attention skills, it's really easy to get flooded by these strong emotions, which is why focusing is at that center of that mandala we were talking about. Also, when we talk about the brain, we have a little hand motion uh, idea we use with children too, something like what dance is, which is we talk about two different parts of the brain. Dan was talking about, Dr. Siegel was talking about that this morning. We've got the emotional brain, we're going to call that. The emotional brain can get really loud, right, like this. And we've got the problem-solving part of the brain. That's right up front, just what Dan was talking about. And what happens is when the emotional part of the brain gets loud, 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 it's really hard for the problem-solving part of the brain to do its work, right? What we know with mindfulness in adults is that mindfulness moves brain activity from the emotional part of the brain into the problem-solving part of the brain so it can do its job. Now, I was recently presenting at UC San Diego, and Amishi Jha was there, and she's a fantastic neuroscientist, and she said, you know what, Susan, it works the other way, too. If you get this problem-solving part of the brain really, really strong, it can turn around and it can quiet the emotional part of the brain. So that's what we're learning and that's what we're teaching children with the balance part. And when that part of the brain is quiet, when the emotional part of the brain is quiet, then the problem solving part of the brain can see more clearly. And now we're up to the C, the C of compassion. And C of compassion, caring and connecting are the two strategies. And Dan talked this morning about the science behind that. One of the things we've known for a long time is that if you develop the ability to empathize with other people. The more you can empathize with other people, that part of the, your brain and your nervous system gets stronger and it actually helps you understand yourself. The more you can understand other people, you're better able to understand yourself. Well, one of the things that Dan has done that's been a huge contribution to mindfulness is he has taken the research and been and talk to everybody about how it works the other way around too. The more introspective you are, the better you understand what's going inside of yourself, then that part of the brain gets stronger and it makes 
it's stronger in your ability to be able to understand other people. So it works both ways. The more we understand, the more we can understand other people. The more we understand other people, the more we can understand ourselves and have caring and connected relationships. But one of the things that's really important with mindfulness is that we always start with ourselves. We start with ourselves with attention, and we start with ourselves with compassion too. And the compassion piece is extremely important because the wisdom does not come from being perfect. Really important, especially when working with middle schoolers. Uh, this perfectionism that we have in our schools right now and with a lot of the students we're working with and helping them understand that wisdom doesn't come from perfection, it comes from presence. And what's presence? It's that way of being in the world that we were talking about. That way of being in the world with attention, balance, and compassion. So I think we're getting close to the end now of my time, so I would like to end with a song. How do you guys feel about learning a song? And it's a song that we sing with, our ch with the children I work with, and it goes like this. It goes, follow the light within, follow the light within. It's your heart that's telling me you, where is your freedom? Follow the light within. So we're gonna sing it three times, okay? Follow the light within. Follow the light within. It's your heart that's telling me. Help me out, guys. Where is your freedom? Follow the light within. Two more times. I'm going to sing quietly. Follow the light within. Follow the light within. It's your heart that's telling you. Where is your freedom? Follow the light within. Last time. Follow the light within. Follow the light within. It's your heart that's telling you where is your freedom. Follow the light within. Thank you for your attention.